Okay, next slide. Okay. So what is a model of again? What's that things today? I'm not too sure we'll do. Hmm. Maybe I turn two pages. Ah. Yeah. Okay, well I just talked about that. Let's turn the next slide. Okay. Everybody has models of reality. You come with a model of reality. You get a model of reality out of your culture. Your experience, you experience reality, then translate that experience into a model. Know it or not, you have a model of reality, most likely based on cultural beliefs. Models represent best guesses. Again, not facts. Your notion of reality, my notion of reality, scientific and religious notions of reality all represent reality models. Okay, so what makes a model a good model? A good model is one that explains the most data, can explain the most things that we see, most observations. That's what makes a good model. So there's lots of models, but most of them only explain a certain subset of data. They don't explain everything. So we grade a model by being a better model or a worse model based on how much they explain. How much of the facts do they, can they describe? Only if you're a scientist do you get to call your beliefs assumptions and claim that your models represent facts. That's, that's, a, that's an advantage of being a scientist. You, you don't have beliefs, you have assumptions. And you don't have models, you have facts. But if you're not a scientist, you, you can't do that. So. Okay, so don't confuse the math, the rules, the interaction logic, or the metaphors or slogans used to describe reality with reality. All conceptualizations, including scientific ones, are models. So re religious models, um, cultural models, they're all models. Okay, when you talked about gravity, and I'm gonna mention a word here, uh, falsifiability. Sometimes people ask, well, is your model falsifiable? Okay, what that means, falsifiable, to be falsifiable, you need a prediction and an objective physical experiment that can prove the prediction wrong. That's what falsifiable means. Okay. An objective physical experiment that can prove the prediction wrong, then it's falsifiable. Well, notice that limits you to things that have objective physical experiments. So falsifiability is very highly biased towards only being a useful concept for objective physical experiments. If you go beyond that, then falsifiable is not really such an applicable idea, an applicable term. Okay. For instance, uh, we talked about this a, li a little bit, but if you have uh, gravity and your falsifiable experiment is you'll drop the rock. Now I can prove that gravity is false if I drop the rock and it doesn't fall. Okay. Now if, if I drop the rock and it does fall, that proves gravity exists, but it doesn't prove what causes gravity. It says nothing about the causation. It only tells you that there's, that there's gravity there. So we can model it with masses attracting, or we can model it with curved space-time. But those are both models. And models have a way of turning up wrong a couple of generations later as we learn more. So best to be skeptical of, of models. Um, let's see. So also the scientific method. That's another one. Scientific method requires that everybody who does the same experiment gets the same answer. 
and they can do it anywhere. Anywhere in the universe, they do the same experiment, they'll get the same answer. That assumes that all scientific experiments are entirely objective. So here we have a scientific method, and that works wonderfully for objective, causal, you know, material things. But once we go, once we go beyond objective into the subjective, when you do a subjective experiment, everybody's going to get a different answer. What are subjective experiments? All the soft sciences do subjective experiments. You know, sociology, economics, psychology, medicine. There are no objective experiments in medicine. If I give somebody a pill to get rid of headaches, so somebody says, I have a headache, okay, I'll give you this pill. And now you say, my headache's gone. That does not show objectively that the pill made the headache go away. The headache may have just gone away anyway. See? So that's not objective. Well, that's true with all of those soft sciences. They're not objective. So the scientific method doesn't fit them. They fall outside of that. Falsifiability falls outside of that because you can't do an objective experiment. That's why they're called soft scientists, and that's why the hard scientists, which is physics, chemistry, biology, often don't feel like the soft sciences are, they're not really science. You know? Well, they are really science. You can't deny that Medicine, you know, is a science, even if it has to be done statistically. The mathematics that, that describes soft science is statistics and probability. So you have to give that pill to 1,000 people who have headaches and see how many of them get rid of their headache. And then you have to have another 1,000 people standing by with headaches that you don't give them anything and see how many of them get rid of their headache. And then you do statistics between the two groups and decide whether or not you have statistical significance. That's how that science is done. And consciousness science is the same way. Consciousness science is subjective, and it's done with statistics and probability. That's how we understand that we have an effect Okay, we, we heal one person with our mind, well, they may have just gotten better anyway. But if you do it a thousand times, and keep some statistics, <laughs> and out of that thousand, 995 of them got better right after you did that, and a control group didn't, now you can show you know, statistical significance of your healing with your mind. So it works the same way. So we are not actually outside of science. We're only outside of that little group called hard science that deals exclusively with things that have very small uncertainty. You see? Though the hard scientists would like to push us off the cliff and say, you know, it's not real science, but it is. They just have carved out a niche that they serve, and they serve well, and a niche that needs to be served by them. But it's not all of science. Yes, consciousness can be a science too. Just because it's subjective doesn't take it out of the realm of good science. Okay. Um, now, my big toe does indeed have a lot of falsifiable predictions. Uh, even though it is a subjective science, it also tells, tells things or says things, predicts things about the real world. Um, Mind and matter effects. Okay. Those are those are predicted. There's a lot of those. Uh, you know, even the placebo effect is an old one. Healing, remote viewing, all those sorts of things. Telekinesis. That's been studied by uh, Target put off at Stanford Research Institute decades ago, at least two decades ago. Very definitive, good quality scientific protocols. Uh, that's moving things with your mind. Telekinesis, you actually can get something to move because of your intent. Okay. All right, so the kind of the result of what we're talking about here in this uh, philosophy of uh, science uh, says don't confuse the model with what's being modeled. Well, that sounds real simple. Don't confuse the 
effect of a thing with the thing that causes the effect. Those are two different things, and that's very trivial, it seems, but it's, it's not. It's, it's harder than that. Another way to make it sound tri trivial is say, don't confuse the map with the territory. That's the that's same, same sort of thing. We can, the question is, can we slip behind the model to actually experience the thing? And the answer is no. So that's not something we can do. We always have to make models of things. We never get to experience the thing itself, only the model of the thing. So we can't slip behind the model of consciousness to experience this fundamental reality directly. There's two reasons. One, experience the overall source of consciousness, you must be outside of consciousness. We have this larger consciousness system and you're a piece of it. How are you going to get outside of consciousness? What would it mean to be outside of consciousness? How would that be defined? You are consciousness. You can't get outside of what you are. You see, so that's one problem with it. So we can't see consciousness from, a, from an objective viewpoint. It has to remain subjective for us. And secondly, we can't experience anything but the data. We get information and we interpret it. We can't experience the source of that information directly. Only the information. So we talk with each other and you're experiencing me and I'm experiencing you, but not directly, indirectly. I'm creating data. I'm sending you the data through all this equipment. It comes out of sound and, and visuals. You take that data and you then interpret that data. And what you interpret may not be what I intended to send. It's your own version of that, you see? So you can't experience me directly. Another way of, of saying this is, is that uh, nobody can share an experience. If you have an experience, it's your experience. As soon as you turn that experience into data to share with someone else, they'll interpret what you say in their own way, based on their own experience, their own fear, their own you know, database. So we can't experience these things directly. All we can do is models. So the fact that this is just a model isn't really a, a fault. It can't help be, but just a model. That's why everybody needs to be able to live gracefully with uncertainty and remain skeptical because it's just a model. So is everything else. So are those electrons. So are those atoms. They're all just models. So we remain skeptical of that. Okay. You know, if you can describe it with math, or you can describe it with a spoken language, it's a model. Because that's the data, you see. The data is different than information. It takes a consciousness to get the information. But we pass information by passing data. The consciousness interprets it. I send it, and how I encode the data, how I encode my information into data to send to you, has to do with my background, my fear, my knowledge base. And then I send it to you and you decode it with your background and your fear and your love and your database. You wonder why it's so hard for us to understand each other? You see, we can't experience anybody else, only ourselves, and they can't experience us. And we can't share our experience with anybody else. It's ours, and only ours. We can only share data, not the experience. Okay. So, we don't get to experience the thing itself when it comes to consciousness. Where is that consciousness system? Can I experience it? No, but we can receive data from it. We can communicate with it. We can communicate inside the virtual realities. Okay. 
we are uh, about to do the double slit experiment again, but we'll do it in a little more detail this time than we did it before, we'll go into a little more depth. And those of you who put your hand up yesterday of not really getting it too well, you'll have another chance. I'll try to speak to it a little differently this time. Okay, we'll change the slides. <coughs> Ah, there we go. I moved this so I wouldn't hit it with my hand. I hit it with my hand already. Okay. Double slit experiment, 1920, thereabouts. A very uh, seminal experiment in physics. This experiment has probably been repeated thousands of times probably in every country on the planet that has a physics department somewhere. Um, it's a well-known, well, you know, often done experiment. It isn't trivial to do. It does take some special equipment, but it's not one of those, you know, million dollar experiments either for a reasonable budget. This can be done in a, in a physics department. Okay, what happened in the, in the double slit experiment is that the experiment was meant to resolve a inconsistency in physics understanding. The inconsistency came about when Albert Einstein, working with the photoelectric effect, came to the conclusion that light was a particle. Light had discrete units of momenta. So he could tell when a, when a when a particle of light hit a particular surface and would create a current, that's the photoelectric effect. And he found that he could, re he could work that down from his experiments to say exactly what that momentum was, the amount of energy that was carried by that photon. So that was like a particle, because particles carry unique chunks of momentum, and so did light. So light was a particle. For the hundred years before that, we had known light as a wave. And light was one of the things that was studied most often back in probably the 1800s. It was studied with prisms that separated the colors and the frequency. It was studied with reflections and, and mirrors and lenses. Optics was one of the major sciences of physics probably in the 1800s. So we, we knew about the waves. And wave theory is the same for all sorts of waves. Light waves, water waves, sound waves work similarly. If you have a, a slit, and these are two slits, this is a slit, and this is a slit, and these are two slits and a barrier. So you take a piece of plastic or metal or something that's a barrier to particles, and you just put two slits in it, with two elongated holes in it. That's what this represents. And if you have a wave that approaches like this from this side, and here's the wave, it gets there. Some of the wave will go through this hole, some of the wave will go through that hole. You may think of a water wave, right? That would make sense. Well, when it does, you see that this wave, here's the one that went through this hole, and it's here, and then it's here, right? And then it's here, and it spreads out as it goes. But now you see these waves are beginning to interact with each other. They, they run into each other here. Well, we get this pattern because when the distance from this point to that center point is exactly the same as this point to that center point because that center point is right straight behind the middle of the, this, this and that are on the same line. So the same distance from here to here as there is from here to here, therefore the waves arrive in phase. A wave does this, and another wave, if they do it together, they're like this. Equal distance, they're in the same phase. This is the phase, so it's the peak phase, the dip phase, and so on, if you like, that's the phase. Now if you start one before the other one, then they can be out of phase, if the starting points are back, or if the distance between them is different. They will get out of phase. So this distance 
from here to here, that line is shorter than this line. Right? That's just the Pythagorean theorem. One line shorter than the other. So, if this distance difference, if the difference between these two distances is some um, integer number of wavelengths, okay, so that one, if this distance is exactly two wavelengths, say, difference, that means you had this one go out and exactly two wavelengths later, this one can't, you know, this one gets there. Then both of the tops will be together, both of the bottoms will be together. You'll have this problem, or not this problem, you'll have this idea of the wave in phase, is what that's called, they will add. So the two peaks add, the two bottoms add, and you just get a bigger wave that's exactly in the same frequency. Now, if here and here, you happen to get them just a half, okay, or three halves, some odd number of halves, of a wavelength difference between them, then they fall like this. A peak falls with a valley, and this peak falls with that valley, and they cancel each other out. One of them is negative by the same amount that the other one is positive, so you get nothing. And that's why you have these little spots in here and here that get nothing, because there's some <coughs> odd you know, odd number of halves, right? Because two halves would be, a, they'd be lined up together. That'd be like even number of wavelengths. So it's one half, three halves, five halves, and so on. Difference in wavelengths between these two things will give you these spots where there's nothing. So that's, that's the way waves work. Well understood. And this is called a diffraction pattern. Sometimes, um, Maybe. Let me try to fix this and put it back behind me where I can't touch it. Let's see if that's safe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, that's not going to work either. Maybe I'll. Uh, that side of the Let's try that. All right. Maybe this is maybe this will work without the static. Okay. So that's why we get this wave pattern. Well understood. Now we find out from Einstein that light is actually a particle. How come you throw particles at these holes and you end up with this light being distributed this way? That seems impossible. What you'd expect is particles to go through the hole and land right behind the hole. That's what particles would do. So when the scientist said, well, light's a particle, we should get this. But light's a wave, we should get this. We have an inconsistency here. We have two <coughs> theories, both of which have been verified, but they contradict each other. So what scientists do then is they do an experiment to try to find out what the contradiction means. And they did. They had a device that would send one photon at a time toward these two slits. And they sent the one photon and another and another. And every time one photon got sent this direction, eventually one photon hit the screen over here. So they'd send a photon, go through the slits, it hit the screen, send another one, it hit the screen. And what they found out after they did this a thousand times or so, enough to register uh, on the screen, they found that most of them landed right here. None of them were here. Less landed here, none here, and even less yet here, and so on. This goes, this goes on and on, just showing you a piece of it. So that was a wave, it looked like a wave. Well, how do these particles go through a slit and then just decide to go up there? or just decide to go down here? And why, do, why, if they just decide, do they do it in the same, most of it here, a little less here, and a little less there? They do it in exact the same quantities they did with a wave. You get an exact wave pattern. And why would those particles do that? What would make them turn, go up there, and hit just those places, and never hit any place in between? 
It's a big mystery. They didn't expect that. So they put detectors, these little red things are, are detectors. They put detectors to see, to make sure they knew that the photon was passing through the slits, that there wasn't something else going on there. So when they put detectors here and they detected a photon, and again, it doesn't have to be a photon, it could be an electron, it could be a hydrogen atom, it could be a helium atom, it could be a water molecule, you know, it could be anything, any particle, even big particles, big molecules like buckyballs, 60 carbon atom, soccer ball looking things. So they send them at these, these slits, they, they detected it. Well, the detector said, got one, just went through this slit, and it always hit right there. And if they got one going through this slit, it always hit right there. Now they had their particle that they expected. But they found that if they turned the detectors off, they got this again. So there was something about looking at the detection that made a difference. Now this is called which way data. It's which way did the particle go through the slit? Did it go through this way or that way? So when you hear me say which way data, that's what I'm talking about. It's the detector data. Well, they did some interesting experiments with this, and one of them was that they, instead of, instead of uh, turning off the detectors, okay, they simply turned off the recorder. Okay, so they were still detecting, but the detecting wasn't being recorded. And when they did that, they still got this diffraction pattern. Well, then they knew it wasn't the detector that was doing it because the detector was still doing its thing. They just didn't record the data. Then they did something else that was even more amazing than that. They did what was called an erasure experiment. They ran the detector, they took the detected data and they recorded it, and then when the experiment was all over, they erased it. What would you think they'd get? They did the experiment, collected the data, the which way data, it's all done, experiment was over, they erased the which way data without having looked at the results or anything, they just erased the which way data immediately. What they got was a diffraction pattern. See, now that's even weirder yet, right? Because you figure they collected the data, there it was, it was on the tape, we've got the data, we've got all that which way information, we get this. That's what they expected to get because that's what happens when you collect the which way data. But after they erased the which way data, this is a delayed erasure, they erased the which way data, they got that. So that told them that it not only wasn't the detector, but it really wasn't the measurement either. You see, now they call this the measurement problem, but it's not really a measurement because a measurement was taken. And it really wasn't that the measurement made this wave function, this probability function uh, collapse there because it seemed to happen in arrears, and they thought, that's really odd. We have things happening, a backwards causality. I erased the data the next day or the next year. It wouldn't make any difference. Time is irrelevant. You could erase it the next second, or you could erase it a decade later. It make no difference. As long as you didn't look at what the results were, and you didn't look, well, you could, I guess you could look at, no, and you didn't look at this either. You just didn't look at either one of them, and you just erased the data a year later you'd end up with this. If you didn't erase the data, you'd get this. So how does erasing the data make the result change? Particularly when you erase the data long after the experiment's over. Big problem, right? I can see in your eyes, you're thinking just like the physicist did at that time. It's like, what is going on here? What's, what is happening here? Well, what that told them is that the key was information. Okay, you can turn the next slide over. The key is information. And that particles are not particles. Particles are probability distributions. 
probability distribution looks like this, which says here's, here's probability going up this direction, that's the P, and then here's distance, and this goes from minus infinity to infinity, and there's this big, broad peak that says this is position, that this particle, this electron or hydrogen atom or photon, it's somewhere between here and here, something big, much bigger than the distance between these slips. So this peak in probability kind of covers up both these slits. So just like the water wave, some of the probability goes through one slit, some of the probability goes through the other. There's no particle yet, just probability. The probabilities interfere with each other, and you end up then with this distribution. And now this distribution starts looking like a probability distribution, where the greatest probability is here. There's zero probability there and there. The next highest probability is here. The next highest probability is at this peak here. So we end up really with a probability distribution of where this particle is supposed to be. So what happens is this way, this particle isn't a particle, it's probability. The probability interferes with itself. And then you say, well, what's the probability of a particle hitting here? Well, let's say it's one in 10. Well, then about one out of every 10 particles will go up there, you see? So it's distributing itself in a probability distribution. So now we have broken the concept of objective materialism. This is not objective materialism. You can't erase the data the day after the experiment and have this result, and you don't erase the data and you have this result. See, that's not objective materialism. So that was, the, that was why this was such a big deal. That's why this experiment was done a thousand times. And uh, that's why you'll find later that uh, Dr. Richard Feynman said, I don't understand quantum mechanics. And neither, of course, does anybody else until now. But now we understand its probability and we understand why it's probability, then we do have a, an understanding of it. What the physicists said is that, okay, it's probability, and that enables us to get the right answer. We can compute with that. What does make that assumption? Is probability, we don't know why, it is, we'll do the math, and we'll compute the right answers. We'll have probability distributions out here, and that's how the particles will do. Well, that's what quantum mechanics is. Quantum mechanics is a, is a science, a subset of physics, that assumes particles or probability distributions and computes results. And it is a very productive science. Quantum mechanics is able to predict the results of experiments very accurately. So it's a really good science that is very successful, probably one of the most successful <laughs> branches of science ever, because it is almost always right. And if it's not right, it's because they've made a mistake in their calculations, or they didn't consider something. So this is good, good science. But they have no idea why. Why does that work? Why does the assumption that particles are probability distributions give you right answers when assuming that particles are little chunks of mass with, you know, with charge or without charge, it doesn't matter about the charge, doesn't give you the right answer. Because little chunks of mass can't any more than this. That's what little chunks of mass have to do. Little chunks of mass aren't going to suddenly change their momentum and go up to some other point. So it's, it's non, it's a, it doesn't work. Okay, so that was the answer. And what they said was that where you make the measurement is where you cause the probability wave to collapse. Here you make the measurement of a particle with the detector that, collapse, that collapses the probability wave, and you get a particle in this reality. It's just manifested there. A particle just appears. It was all probability up to that point, but you make a measurement, you either get a particle or you don't. When you get a particle, it's a particle, and it goes in a straight line. Here, it stays probability, and you don't make the measurement until here. Now you're making a measurement, and you're saying, what's the probability of a particle landing here, or here, or here, or here? See, and you calculate the probability there. So it's just, that's the way quantum mechanics works. OK, 
Okay, so I'm going to uh, go to the next level of quantum mechanics here as we turn the slide. This is a picture, I don't know how well you can see that. This is that delayed erasure experiment that I explained yesterday. And it's a very clever experiment. Actually, this one looks clearer than this, doesn't it? Yeah, this one looks a little clearer, did a better, did a better job. Anyway, we have, here's our double slit right here. We have particles being shot in here. They're, they are photons again. And when they hit, there's a little box here that you can barely see. You can see it a little better over there, but my green spot doesn't light that up too well. Right in there, there's a, little box, there's a little box, and that is a piece of material that when you hit it with a photon, it creates two particles. One particle comes in, hits this plastic, and two particles go out, and they're entangled. And two entangled particles go out from that one. So one of these entangled, let's say if it goes through this slit, one of these entangled particles that comes down here, this is called the idler. This one is called the signal. Those are just the names of the two particles that come out. So the signal goes up here to the screen. Now this screen here at, at zero is the same as the screen. Okay, that's where the experiment's being done. Being done right up here at this detector. And that's uh, B zero. So particle comes in, turns into two particles, one goes right to the screen here, and the other one goes on this path. And it comes here and it reflects off a prism, goes this way, and here's what's called a half-silvered mirror. That's a mirror that 50% of the time the particle goes through it, and the other 50% of the time it reflects off of it. It's called half-silvered. Okay, a whole silver mirror or a 100% silver mirror is a mirror like hanging in your bathroom. You get 100% hits, 100% reflects. This transmits 50% of the time, reflects the other 50% of the time. So it, the, the, uh, the idler then comes down here, changes its direction, hits a half silver mirror. So half the time, it'll go up here in the four. Detector four. The other half of the time, it'll go on this way. Well, I'll, I'll get to that later. So now it means that every time a particle goes through the upper slit, and half of those will be detected up here. So we'll know every time we get a particle in four that we had a particle go through the top slit. That's our which way data. Same down here. Every time a particle goes through the bottom slit, one of them goes straight to the screen where we're taking our data. The other one comes down here, half silver and mirror, and half the time it comes in a detector here. So when we get a detection in three, we know that it went through the bottom slit. But you see this path from here to here is much shorter than this path from here to here to here to here. So we don't collect that which way data until after this data is already been collected. And the detection process is never touched by energy. There's nothing here that, you know, to detect the particle now doesn't have to do with hitting it with some kind of energy or disturbing it in any way. Now the detection process is touchless. So the detecting process cannot in any way affect these particles that are going to the to the screen. No way, because they there is nothing no, they're not touched by any energy at all. Okay, now the other half the time, the half the time we'll get either a so we send the particle here, and half the time we'll get something there that says it went through the top slit, or something there that says it went through the bottom slit. The other half the time it doesn't reflect, it goes through. When it goes through, it hits a mirror, goes down to one of those things that sometimes reflects, half the time reflects and half the time absorbs. When it absorbs, it goes straight through it into one. When it reflects, it goes up here into two. So there's a 50-50 chance that it'll be in either one of those. And the one that goes down this way is exactly the same thing. Comes here and hits a mirror. Half of the time it'll hit and reflect to one. The other half of the time it'll go through to two. 
So now you've erased the which way information because both sides, you see, don't tell you anything because it could go in two or one. Equal probability it could go in either one. So the fact that it ends up in two doesn't tell you which slit it went through because it can end up in two from either one of these. It can end up in one from either one of these. So now we've erased it. The which way information is gone. So this is an experiment. It was done in 1999, published in the year 2000. And it was a fairly big deal in, in uh, biomechanics when it was done. So that's the nature of it. And let's see, uh, what do you think, what do you think happened? Um, every time a particle well, again, let, let me say that when it, when it goes through and does these, the path is much longer than it is from here to here. So again, the eraser takes place after the data has already been collected on the screen. So every time we get a pulse here or here, we go look and say, where did that land here? In other words, there's timing involved to shoot one photon and let's say we shoot a photon, and as soon as we shoot that photon, a nanosecond later, we get a signal in four. All right, well, we know that that one went through the top slip, and we can say, where did that go here? We can, we can find where that particle hit on the screen. And at the same time, every time we get something in three, we know it went through the bottom slip, and we can say, well, let's take a look at that one and see where that one went. We can tell where that one went. And every time it was the data got erased, we can look at those and say, where did they go on the detector? Because we can tell where, where all these things landed on the detector. So, um, all right, let's go to the next slide. Here's the results. So for detector one and detector two, those were those, those, were those two that were Eraser detectors, right? The one and two out on the far side. All the times that the which way data got erased, you got a diffraction pattern. When it was erased after the fact, you know, well, you get a diffraction pattern. And every time you had the which way data, you got a lump like that behind that particular slit. And this just shows you. Uh, one of them, that was uh, three, and four was exactly the same. That's joint detection. Three and four, they just added the data together because they looked the same, and that's why it's got one point. So that was the result. And again, they were doubly mystified because it looked like the results on the screen here were changing depending on what happened after those results had already been taken. And again, they had lots of wild theories of why that happened, and it was, uh, you know, backward causality and all the rest of it. But that's not, you know, that's not how it works. It's that you have, you know, let's see. Can you back up? Can you go backwards a slide? Yeah. That's not how it works. What happens? is it's, as the particle comes in here, it's not a particle. So you keep thinking in terms of particles. And if you think in terms of particles, this is impossible and doesn't make sense. But if you think in terms of probability, we have probability. And that probability has a certain probability function here. But this is a virtual reality. And virtual realities are between players and the computer. And the computer sends the player information. So until the player looks at that, the player hasn't gotten any information on it. You see? It's just potential. Until a player looks at that data, that data is still probability. Even though time's gone on, it's still probability. Time goes on a decade, it's still probability. Now, when they go look at that data, now, the random draw from the probability distribution is made and a result's done. 
Okay, so it's all probability. So it just stays here in a, you know, neither, you know, neither this way nor that way. It's just probability. And the probability has to be calculated at the moment that somebody looks. What's the probability then? Because that's the probability that calculates the data gets sent from the computer to the player. So it's probability. We have the particles, the, the idler particles are coming down here and they have certain probabilities of, of reflecting or, or going this way. So when the experiment is all done, then you look at the data. So if the data shows that there's which way data, then the probability that this is two spots behind a slit goes to one. Because what else could you have if you have which way data? You've seen a particle go through a slit, you have to have a particle land behind a slit. And on those where the uh, which way data was erased, you don't have any data. So you get the default answer, which is a diffraction pattern. Okay. So what we have is a virtual reality with a player, a consciousness, and a computer. The computer sends the player information when the player looks at the information. The computer can't send the player information before the, you know, before, I mean, the computer can't send the player information before the player looks. That wouldn't make any sense. The player has to look, say, what's here? What do I see here? And it gets data for what it sees there based on the probability at the time. So that's why it works this way. There was a Erwin Schrodinger, who was one of the, the uh, physicists that helped invent quantum mechanics. He came up with a little scheme that was called the, uh, the uh, cat, you know, Schrodinger's cat, you know, a little paradox. And he actually did this to demonstrate how ridiculous this result was. He knew it was result, and he knew that that's the way the calculations worked, and he, know that, he knew that that's, you know, that's the results you got, but he thought it was ridiculous nonetheless. And just to show that, he said, well, what if we have a bunch of cats, and we put a cat in a box. This, was, this is not uh, cat friendly, by the way. You put a cat in a box, and you rig up a situation where there is a, a um, radioactive source and the radioactive source throws out particles. That's what radioactive means. It throws out little particles. And you have a detector. And if one of these uh, radioactive source always throws particles out in random directions, and your detector is just a little tiny thing. So there's a chance that it'll throw out a particle that'll hit the detector, but a much bigger chance that it'll throw out a particle that won't hit the detector. So you put all the cats in the boxes, you put in the radioactive source and the detector, and if the detector gets hit with a particle, it puts, it breaks a glass and puts poison into the box with the cat, kills the cat, all right? So then they have all these things and they lock them all up and Schrodinger said, according to quantum mechanics, the cats are neither dead nor alive. They're suspended in a in-between state Superposition of possibilities in probability talk that it's, you know, you have these different possibilities with probabilities and they're suspended in this probabilistic view. So the cats are neither dead or alive. And of course, in the deterministic viewpoint with uh, materialism and objectivity, the cats are either dead or alive. They're not both. In quantum mechanics, the cats could be either. They're indeterminate. It's not an either or. They're both. And you don't know until you open a box and see. Well, of course, in this experiment, if you wait long enough, eventually all the, all the little things will hit, will hit that detector, you know, eventually, and then all the cats will be gone, and then that's just a probability function of how long do you have to wait before the probability that all the cats are, have been killed is 0.8 or 0.9. You see, but still, any particular cat is both dead and alive, or it has that potential. They're all in a state of potentiality. So you wait until it's 50-50, then those cats that are dead and those cats that are alive, we don't know yet. They're all both, until you open a box and then the probability wave collapses to an actual result. 
So that was the that was Schrodinger's cat, and everybody had a good laugh at that because it does show that it's kind of silly, you see, but that's the way it works. This source just stays probability. You see, it's neither this nor that until somebody looks. Now that's the justification for saying that consciousness, you saw, and I'll read some of those quotes again, you saw here where some of the Einstein and Planck and others were saying consciousness, Wigner, consciousness is the key here. Consciousness is the key in the sense that it isn't until a consciousness looks, in other words, a player gets the data from the computer that it's determined whether you got this or this. And when that player does look, what makes the difference is what information's around. It's the information that determines the probability. If there indeed is which way data, then the probability is zero for it to be this way and one for it to be that way. If there is no which way data, it's one for it to be this way and zero for it to be that way. And that can switch any time. Even years later, that's still just probability. Well, that tells us we live in a probabilistic virtual reality. It's the only way to explain this that it makes rational sense. Okay, let's uh, change the slide. Okay. So hopefully everybody is kind of with me on that and kind of sees where that, you know, why physicists were confused, why this was a what's going on here kind of a problem because it just flew in the face of materialistic determinism. It wasn't objective at all, and it always works the same way. I mean, they've done this so many times, and this is, this is the way life is. And that a virtual reality that maintains a relationship between a computer and the consciousness that is playing an avatar in the virtual reality and must send data to the player when the player makes a measurement. So we see it was called a measurement problem. It was called a con it was consciousness collapses the wave flow, measurement collapses the probability wave. But actually, even though those things are true, consciousness is involved because it has to be a player. And the player is a consciousness. And yes, the player has to make a measurement before he gets the data for that measurement. So those things are involved. But the key thing is information, because the information sets the probabilities, you see. The probabilities are determined by the information that is available in this physical reality. So whatever that information is, that determines the probability, and that probability determines the data that the computer has to send to the player. So that's, the do that's, this, that's how this works and why it works that way. Um, let's see, I'm, I, let's make an experiment to make this uh, a little clearer. We can kind of go back to this more simplistic. That other thing was pretty, pretty complex and stretch your brain a little bit. So we'll go back to the simpler one. And let's just make a, a simple experiment here. Now, this is just a thought experiment. This is not an experiment that's ever been done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do... Uh, I'm going to recast what I just showed you that was complicated into something simpler but has the same logical um, foundation, the same logic um, results. And that is, let's do this experiment 102 times. We'll just repeat it. That's a, that's a uh, fire a photon. See, I'm really doing this, this complicated thing here. But we're going to fire a photon. We're going to detect it. We're going to record the information, and then we're going to go do it again. We're going to fire another, you know, we're going to fire a lot of photons at that one until we, until we get enough photons to cause a result. And then we'll put that away, and we'll put another one up exactly the same. We'll fire another 10,000 photons at that. We'll put it away and do another. We're going to do 102 of these. This experiment. And what I'm going to do is every time I do an experiment, I'm going to take this which way data, this detector data, I'm going to put that in an envelope seal it. I'm going to take this screen measurement data, put that in another envelope, and seal it. Take those two envelopes and put them in a bigger envelope that says experiment number one. And I do that again for two, three, and four, and all the way up to 102. So I have 102 of these big envelopes, right? 
Each envelope has in it the a sealed envelope with the detector data and a sealed envelope with the result data on a screen. Nobody's ever looked at any of it. Just taking the data and stuck it in these envelopes and it, data doesn't belong, it's not on a computer or anything else. It only exists right here. But now I'm going to do a delayed erasure experiment. Take all the envelopes and to make sure you did the experiment right, we'll take number one and number 102 and we'll open up the envelopes and we'll look at the data. Now, does it make any difference which one you look at first, whether you look at the detector data first or whether you look at that? The answer is no, it doesn't make any difference. I'm just gonna look at the data. And when I look at the data, they will show this, two piles of particles behind each slip. Well, sure, right? That's the experiment we did. So I did an 102 and I did one, and this is what I get when I look. So now we think, well, all of them, you know, we got the first one and the last one, and all the ones in between were done just like that. So we're pretty confident that all the ones in between have been done right. And if we looked at all of them, we're very confident that we'd see this on all 102 of them. Okay, now I'm gonna take those envelopes, I'm gonna shuffle them, I'm gonna pull out 50 of them, because there's 100 left. I'm gonna pull out 50 of them. And that 50, I'm gonna open the big envelope, I'm gonna take out the detector data envelope, I'm going to set it on fire and burn it. That's erasure. It doesn't matter whether I do this a decade later or an hour later. So if we want to be dramatic, we could say a decade later, right? <laughs> Pull this out of the safe. And we, 50 of these, we randomly select, take out the detector data and burn it. And what would you see? Well, the 50, that still had both envelopes in. We'd look at those and every one of them was just like this. The 50, where we burned the detector data, would all look like this. You see, now that makes it simpler to, to get, I think, if you put it in that kind of a framework. It's, it's a little easier to deal with it. That's not a real experiment because physicists don't do things with envelopes and storing things in safes and that kind of stuff because there's room for meddling and cheating and that kind of stuff. They do things that are impossible to meddle and cheat. That's better science. So nobody will ever do that, but it's just a, an analog, a logical analog to this complex one. That's what the complex one was all about. You have a delayed erasure and it looks like at the end, all the ones where you burnt the detector data, somehow you know they had this in there and they turned into that and it looks like things were changed at the end. Nothing was changed at the end. There was nothing here other than probability of what might be there. And once you burned that detector data, the probability changed. You see? So that when this was opened, when this envelope was opened, you saw that. Because now the probability was different than it was before you burnt them. So it's really about information. See, that makes it clear that it's about information. It's also about consciousness because you have to have a player to get the data, but um, it's fundamentally about information, what the information is. So that's kind of a, a thought. And I, I could, we could maybe go through more of those. You know, we could do like the bear, you know, we could have uh, you know, somebody cheat and then get run over by a truck and how it would change things. But I think you can, I don't think we have to overkill it. I think you've got the idea that this is how the double slit experiment works. And you can erase data and make a difference. So I, maybe I will do one of them. If you had somebody cheat and go into the safe where it was being held for the decade before you did this rest of the experiment, and they got in there and they looked at all of them, okay, and, and they saw that they were all just like this, and then they and their cameras and everything else got destroyed, would the experiment still work? And the answer is yes, because there's no information here that says that it wouldn't work. The key is what information is in this physical reality that could conflict with the results when you look at them. And the system says we don't want any conflicts. Now it doesn't matter that these non-physical databases we talked about yesterday 
have information in them that says this guy cheated and he went in and he looked at him. Because that's not here. That's not in this reality. It's all about this reality being consistent, having a consistent history. That's the thing. Now the reason why the default value is always this, why is that the default value? That has to be the default value because the system has to have a consistent boundary between particles and waves. You see, that's the same way that waves work. So when you do this with a wave, you get the same result. Otherwise, it would be odd if you send all these particles through and you ain't got some other result. That's the result you get with waves, then this is consistent. So that's why the probabilities combine with a, with a trig function just like the waves do. It's a mathematical process that does this, uh, you know, that, that, that creates this. And they, it uses the same process. So anyway, that's the double slit. And now I think you see why this double slit is such a big deal. Because it says that our reality is not objective. It is not materialistic. It can't be, because if it was, it couldn't work that way, and that's the way it works. So there we have it, 1920, 1920s, we knew this and we understood it. And most of you, unless you've been you know, reading about it somewhere else, never heard of this. Most people never heard of the double slit experiment. They have no idea this is even like that. Yet here's a big discovery in science that is unheard of. Nobody really knows it works. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, Physicists don't like to talk about their failures, like anybody else. Einstein spent the last 25 years of his life trying to figure these things out and failed. Feynman, the, uh, you know, one of the most re renowned quantum theorists who died a, few, died a decade ago or so, maybe a couple of decades ago, he couldn't figure it out. So if the best of the best couldn't figure it out. What hope did anybody else have of figuring it out? And if you go in and do research in an area where you can't publish any answers and at the end of the day you spent the research money and you've done all the work and you said, well, I really don't have any results, I can't figure it out, that's a career killer. So that's not what you do. You do your research on something that will get you results that you can publish, that you can get credit for and everybody shake your hand and smile. Not well, yeah, I couldn't figure it out. So scientists went away from it. They stopped looking at it. It was a dead end. It was a career killer. And it was embarrassing because this is a major thing in physics that, that uh, tells that their fundamental idea of reality is wrong. So that's why 80 years later, here we are today, 80 years later, and we've regressed. We weren't as smart about this as we were 80 years ago. 80 years ago, all the scientists were, wow, look at this, isn't this wonderful? And now it's like, don't look at that. <laughs> we, don't want, we don't want to look at that. You know, put that under the rug or in a corner someplace. We're really not interested in looking at that anymore. So that's the thing, and also there's other hard problems in physics as well, and mostly the hard problems get pushed under the rug because they're hard. And you don't know the answer, and hardly anybody wants to stand up and say, hey, I don't know the answer. Feynman did. Feynman was a smart guy, and he stood up and said, I don't understand quantum mechanics. Give him a gold star for that. That took courage to do that. But he did, and because it was true. Okay. All right, let's turn over. And this next one, next slide, that's just in case any of you want to check on me to make sure I haven't been kidding you. This is the paper. Um, that's, the, that's where you can find it. Here's a, here's, a, uh, you know, here's a link for it. I'll give you a few moments. I see a couple of people you know, writing that down. That's the link. If you go to that link, you'll get this paper, and uh, you can read it in its original physics speak. 
Now, it's a, maybe a little hard unless you speak physics speak, but there's enough words there that I think you can get the gist of what I just told you out of looking at it. And you'll see the exact same diagram that I had up because I stole it from that paper. So, so anyway, I wanted to give everybody a chance to write that down if, if they're interested in, in that experiment. But you see it published in the year 2000. Today, in physics departments all over, you will have physicists swearing that the reason the double slit experiment acts the way it does is because of the interaction of the energy of the detector. When it detects the photon going through the slits, that somehow that energy affects that photon and causes the, you know, causes the uh, decoherence, which means it ends up in a pile, which has been demonstrated at least through different experiments that isn't the case. But because that is a material, that's an objective. If that were true, then it would be objective. And the beliefs would be upheld. So a lot of physicists, maybe even a majority of physicists, still swear that that's true, that that's what's going on, even though experiments all the way back to 70 and 80 years ago, much less more elegant ones like this, have shown to the contrary. It's still a major belief. Why? Because people, scientists, like everybody else, cling to their beliefs. And when they get information that conflicts with their beliefs, in this case, what they did was say, well, it's this weird information. Let's discount it. We just don't understand how to say that in the right words yet. It's a mystery. Instead of, <laughs> instead of accepting it as information, they pushed it away and called it strange. So even today, probably a majority of physicists will claim that it's the interaction with the, with the slip, but it is not. This experiment didn't have any energy touching it at all. So here's some, uh, go to the next one. Here's some quotes, some of which you heard yesterday, but there are people here who weren't here yesterday Plus, there's going to be viewers on YouTube eventually that weren't here yesterday. So we need to do this, and hopefully it will fill you in. Seeing it, seeing it twice makes it easier to grasp than just seeing it once. It's a hard thing to grasp because it's so anti-intuitive to what you've learned as your reality model. Okay, so um, this, is, this is a little different. I guess yesterday we didn't do this one. Werner Heisenberg. The only thing that can accurately describe an elementary particle is a probability function that in itself contains nothing about the quality of being or the physical existence of that particle. Werner Heisenberg was one of the key guys, he and not Bohr. Niels Bohr, the common sense view of the world in terms of objects that really exist out there independently of our observations totally collapses in the face of the quantum factor. In quantum mechanics, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Well, that's my favorite. Every great and deep difficulty bears in itself its own solution. It forces us to change our thinking in order to find it. That means that if you get it, if you run into the wall where you just don't understand it, and it just seems to be impossible to get to there from here, he says, what's required? is a new paradigm, a new way of looking at it. Not just saying, oh, well, that's weird. Let's go on. What's required is a new way of looking at the problem. So physicists find themselves looking for an answer in a solution space that doesn't contain the answer. That's the problem. Okay, and Bohr and Heisenberg were both Nobel Prize winners and uh, two of the finding fathers of quantum mechanics. So that's what the quantum mechanics people uh, thought of it then. And remember from yesterday, we have these quotes, Einstein, reality is merely an illusion, and uh, Eugene Wigner, also uh, another uh, Nobel Prize winner and one of the originers of quantum mechanics. It said, it remain remarkable in whatever way our future accepts, in, in, 
in whatever way our future concepts may develop that the very study of the external world led to the scientific conclusion that the content of the consciousness is the ultimate universal reality. Max Planck, science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature because in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of that mystery we're trying to solve. Einstein said, no problem can be solved from the same level of thinking that created it. That is, if you can't find a solution, you need to find a different perspective. You can't just keep on with the same old perspective and expect to find a solution. Niels Bohr said, every great and deep difficulty bears in itself its own solution. It forces us to change our thinking in order to find it. So it forces us to find a different paradigm. Well, they were looking for a different paradigm, but couldn't find one. Einstein looked for, like I say, 25 years and couldn't find one. Why couldn't they find a paradigm? Because the paradigm that gives the solution to this is virtual reality. And in the 1920s, virtual reality was not a concept. You see, so it's not that these guys just weren't smart enough to figure it out. It just wasn't in their reality. Virtual reality, computers weren't in their reality yet. You know, that was decades and decades before the first tiny little computer that was more like a, one of these little $5 uh, adding things that you get, you know, hadn't been invented yet. So they just didn't have the concepts in which to solve this problem. They were brilliant people, but they were ahead of their time. But now, here we are today, virtual reality games, all our kids are playing them. We're probably playing them too. They're, we've all seen the matrix. You know, uh, this idea of virtual reality is not that hard to uh, conceive of anymore. It's right there. So it's not that now we're all smarter than Einstein and Heisenberg and Bohr because we can figure this out. It's that now we have the tools and the concepts to make sense of this. The problem being is that the physicists, instead of saying, we need to find a new paradigm to make sense of this, they said, let's shove this under the rug and forget about it. We'll just call it weird science and let it go because otherwise we're going to break our beliefs in a objective materialism. Now we don't want to do that because... In archaeology, it's the same thing. In archaeology, it's the same problem. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's where we are today. We've gone backwards. We don't, like I say, most of the physicists walking around well, don't even know. Where if they've seen this experiment, they say, yeah, something must have been wrong. You see? Yeah, they, those guys, they made it up, or something's wrong, it couldn't possibly be. It's, you know, the world doesn't work like that. It's objective, and it's material. We know that. So when you run into beliefs, and it doesn't matter whether it's a scientific belief, or a religious belief, or a cultural belief, when you run into beliefs, people deny information that conflicts with their beliefs. That's just the way it is. Just deny it and go on. So that's where we are. We've been in denial for 80 years and refused to work on the problem because there was no, no um, career value in it, because there was no solution. And we're stuck in that now when there is a solution. We don't want to see it. Okay, um, let's go on. I got two more, two more quotes. Okay, I think it's next hmm. Well, you don't have the same slides I do. Yeah. I did Eugene Wigner, we did Max Planck. Let's go on over to uh, I think I did Albert Einstein. This was his unified field theory. You can uh, go on with that's a good one. Keep that up. I'll catch up with you. Quantum mechanics now, and this is what we've just talked about. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, Richard Feynman is a very good scientist. He was a quantum mechanics theorist, dead for about a decade. 
Um, these are some quotes. I don't understand quantum mechanics. The man was honest. He also said the double slit experiment contains the basic mystery of quantum mechanics. Again, true. He understood what he was doing. This one is kind of funny because that's what he told his students when his students asked him to explain why it worked that way. You know, we don't go there. Shut up and calculate. In other words, he was being facetious. What he was saying is, we don't know. There's no answer I can give you. It's just weird science. What we can do is calculate. What we can do is pretend that there are really probability distributions and calculate the right answer. So that's what he was telling them, that there is, there is no answer. Just shut up and calculate because there isn't an answer. So quantum mechanics represents a phenomenon that's impossible to explain. You so say, given up, it's impossible, can't do that. When you give up like that, that takes you out of responsibility for finding an answer. Once you've declared it to be impossible, you no longer have to be embarrassed that you can't do it because nobody expects you to do the impossible. So that's why we have these things. Um, okay, so the big question is, why should physical particles be represented by probability distributions? How do we interpret that in terms of objective reality? You can interpret it in terms of an objective reality. You have to take it at face value. They are probability distributions. That's the nature of reality. Okay, and uh, let's see. The reason for all the, the denial, other than a, a career killer, is that it frightens physicists to go to where the answer is. The answer is that it's a virtual world. When you have a virtual world, you have to have they know a, a, a simulation cannot compute itself. You have to have other, a non-physical other that is the source of your reality. That leads them you know, to apoplexy when they hear that. There's a non-physical source that's the source of this reality. You see, now they've just gone back to where you know, the Pope was in charge. Right back in the 1500s when religion dominated all of society and people who disagreed were burnt at the stake. And science was beholding to the church. And when, um, you know, Galileo, who came up with data that showed the earth wasn't the center of the universe, was put under house arrest. He spent all the rest of his days confined. And others met with the same fate. So science was, was a... It was a pretty tough thing to be in those days because if you said something that disagreed with the church, then you were punished for that. It was heresy. And when the scientists get this idea that in a virtual reality has to be computed in other, as Fredkin said, has to be computed in a non-physical reality frame, that sounds awful lot like religion to them and they just don't want to go there. That's a scary idea. That's going backwards. Back at the time when uh, things that were not objective ruled. You see, these are kind of subjective ideas, right, of this virtual reality. So that's why it's not just that the physicists are just too thick-headed to you know, do their job. They see this as a, as a scary place, a scary step to take that we could end up going backwards when we give other and non-physical reality, make it real. Because when the scientists say, yea, verily, we are derived from a non-physical source, then they've just opened the floodgates. And they know that. That's a biggie. And that isn't going to be just contained in the little world of science, like the double slit experiment. It's just contained in this little world of science. If you're not a physicist, you've probably never heard of that. And even if you are a physicist, you've probably never been told about what the one experiment I showed you. They don't particularly like those because they're embarrassing and they're hard to understand. So this would throw it out in the world of everybody. Everybody's got a stake in the source of our reality is non-physical. And that affects all of us. Well, what does that mean to us? Who are we then? 
we're not just these little body machines that, you know, are deterministic biology that just chugs along doing what it's supposed to do. We have purpose. There's a source. You know, is this religious? What is it? The scientists don't want to go there. So even now they're being drugged, kicking and screaming by their experiments to accept that this is a virtual reality. They still won't say, well, if it's a virtual reality, it can't compute itself. They know that, but they won't say that in public because that's just scary. Not only that, when you no longer have an objective causality, the scientific method no longer applies. Scientific method only applies to an objective causality. Every experiment can be done anywhere in the universe by anybody and you always get the same answer. Subjective things like non-physical realities, you see, that have to do with consciousness that's purely subjective, none of that holds. So they get it, they, they see a big demotion coming from the high priests of Western culture where they tell everybody else what's true to those guys that work with stuff. You know, it's a, it's a big demotion. So there's a lot of reasons why physicists aren't doing that. It's not just their careers. It's a, it's a very bitter pill for them to swallow and a very scary one. So that's why it's going to take time. And uh, I think it was uh, Planck, maybe Schrodinger, but I think it was Planck who said that science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> that was a quote from Planck. And uh, what he was saying is that because these guys in quantum mechanics, of course, was, a, was kind of the inside crew, you know, the 10 or 20 people who were doing these experiments and figuring this out. And they were telling the rest of their physicist brethren about this, and everybody else was telling them that they were insane. They obviously had made mistakes and couldn't possibly know what they were talking about. So they were bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and found this big new idea, and everybody else was telling them they were nuts. So that's why he made that comment about one funeral at a time. It was very hard even then to convince other physicists that this is the way the experiments were. So that, uh, that is why we spend so much time on this double slit experiment, because that is science showing you that the fundamental reality is non-physical and, re and consciousness. That's not, that's not a, 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 you know, a monk telling you that, or uh, you, know, you read it in a New Age book. This is fundamental physics been around for almost 80 years, and all, anybody that does the experiment gets the same result. So it's a fact of our life, and it tells us that reality is virtual, and consciousness is the computer. That's what we get from this. So the way, the way physics grows is that it goes through steps of bigger and bigger pictures. So we had little pictures a long time ago. The Earth was the center of the universe. The Earth was flat. These were little pictures. Worked fine for them. I mean, it seemed like the Earth was at the center because you looked at all the stuff in the sky so you keep going around, right? So that means you're in the center, doesn't it? And it seemed like it was flat because if you kept walking in one direction, you never got to a place where it got steeper and steeper and then you fell off. And the water in the oceans didn't run off the sides, so it was flat, right? I mean, that made sense, and if anything was on the other side, it'd fall off. So nobody experienced any of those things, so flat made good sense. And then we got a bigger picture. And when we got the bigger picture, we still keep those other pictures. We still look up and, and, and uh, see the sun going around us. You know, during the day, we still think of it that way. It rises in the east, it sets in the west, and, you know, we, we kind of see that, and we, we survey with flat, flat earth for our, for our surveying, because that's a good approximation. Well, now we have, a, we have a bigger theory now, this virtual reality theory, and virtual reality theory based upon consciousness as the computer has uh, now produced a bigger picture where in physics, science, all the hard sciences, are just a subset of the bigger picture. That part of science that deals with 
low uncertainty, things that have little uncertainty. And that's what physics does. And within that subset, there's quantum mechanics and there's relativity, you see. They both are parts of that. Both of them are just partial parts. And there's, there's classical mechanics, that's still in there. So that's the way science grows, a series of bigger pictures. And we don't throw away the little pictures, we just keep using them. But we understand they're not actually correct. They're just a, a subset, but still useful. Well, that's what will happen this time. Uh, it's just going to just going to take some time before we get there. And the scientists might be right. There may be a, a food fight. There may be a uh, a lot of turmoil generated when they say the high priests of science tell you that our reality is a subset of something larger that's non-physical. Now, well, every religion on the planet claim that it's their God who's in charge of that thing, and then is there going to be, uh, you know, back to the religious wars of whose God is the larger consciousness system and so on? Could be, you see, if we haven't outgrown that kind of thing, we could regress, we could go backwards. Hopefully there'll be enough understanding in the land that that won't happen, that we can see it from another perspective that is science. So that's part of my purpose for, for doing all this is to create a science that when we get to that big decision, which isn't that far off, you know, we're only maybe a decade or so away from that revelation. I don't know, maybe physicists will drag their feet for, for several decades yet avoiding that, but sooner or later that's going to happen. And when it does, I hope we have the good sense as a, as a species, humanity, to see this as science not as a regression to the bad old days, but as a great leap forward to the better new days where we have a bigger picture, where we can be inclusive, where we can understand our experiences better, where spirituality and, and the soft sciences become real sciences and necessary, where we have purpose, where becoming love is, is important and everybody needs to work on that. If we turn that corner, then everything's gonna get really good much more quickly. People are much better playing a game if they know what the game is. So understanding that, we could take a great leap forward. Not understanding that, we could take a great leap backward. So we live in interesting times. And it's important that we kind of have this understanding of a bigger picture without all the fear and ego that's attached to my God's bigger than your God, you know, sort of thing. That's not a healthy path to go on. All right, I'll turn it again. Okay, so we talk about physics being the, the studying the realm of things of little. Um, next slide. Yeah. Studying the realm of things with low uncertainty. You see, uncertainty is the key in all these things. The reason the double slit experiment acted the way it did is because we were so uncertain where the particle was. Because we were uncertain where the particle was, then there was probability that it could have been here or here. So the probability goes through both slits until it reaches where the measurement's taken, where a consciousness player gets a message from the from the computer. Okay, it's because of the uncertainty was the problem. If somebody were firing bullets at those slits, there'd be little uncertainty, you see? Very little uncertainty. If somebody were throwing baseballs at two big slits, there's no uncertainty. We know where that baseball is to five significant figures. We know what slit it's gonna go through when we aim it, you see? Same with that, that bullet, so there is no uncertainty. So now the probability function for that bullet is real tiny, tiny, right around the edge of the bullet, right? The uncertainty is only in a tiny little fifth decimal place as to where that bullet is. And that's small, a little uncertainty compared to this big slit that it takes for the bullet to go through. So you see, we don't have that effect. So we have to, this effect works on things that are, that are, have, have uh, uncertainty. Now it turns out that everything is attached to some uncertainty. We are not certain, really, of anything. 
in our reality of our world. I mean, I know people say you're certain of death and taxes, right? But that's, that's a little different than what I'm talking about. Everything, every measurement has a measurement error. Right? You can measure, um, you know, you say a, a brick is objective. There's a brick and it's objective. It's got so much volume, it's so long, it's so wide, it's so high, and that's the brick. But how long is it really? Well, you get uh, 10 people to measure it, you get 10 different answers. Depends on how they measure it. They could measure it down to the length of a, of a, of a half of a wavelength of laser light. Well, that's, okay, now they've, now they've got it down to about seven or eight decimal places, nine decimal places, but pretty soon you can't even tell where the edge is. The edge is bumpy. It's got all, kind, you know, that brick, if you look at it down at the molecular level, it's not a smooth surface. Like it looks to us, it's bumpy, something sticking out, some dips. Where is the end of that brick? Where do you measure from? Well, you take an average of all those bumps and dips and you measure from there. See, now you're into statistics again. You can't determine how long it is. There's no definition of where it starts and where it stops at that level of precision. And it's the same with weight. It's the same with everything. So there's always error. There's always uncertainty. But we in physics claim that it's objective if it's almost objective, if it's objective to two or three decimal places, you see it's subjective. But in fact is, nothing is objective. Everything has some uncertainty to it. All things. Okay, you measure, uh, you measure anything. So the myth of objectivity seems obviously correct to us because we all have similar sensors and we all live in a macro world where constraints are considerable and uncertainties about the stuff in our world relative to object size are small. So that's why our world appears to be objective even though it isn't. So everything is really comes down to a subjective measurement. It's up to the scientist doing the measurement of how he's going to decide where the brick ends and where, and where it began. And if you get down at even a smaller level than that, the sides of that brick aren't even still. The molecules in that brick are doing this. So how can you tell where the thing starts or stops when it's moving around all the time? They're oscillating. They're moving. Particles are flying out of it. Other stuff is you know, coming into it, it's just, it's a dynamic system. It doesn't have a length. It only has a probable length. Because at any particular instant in time, the length's different. When we get back up to our macro scale, it seems like it's perfectly objective, but it isn't. Okay, uh, so the world is fundamentally statistical. And uh, think of uh, places where there are lots of uncertainty. Now, yesterday I talked about an astronomer who looks up into a part of the sky where there was nothing. And what happens is he looks at his telescope and there's one of a hundred things that could be there. He randomly takes a draw from that probability distribution. Now, the probability distribution is all of the possible things, all the possibilities, and the probability that each possibility, you know, might be true. Might be the one that, you know, may be the way it is. So it's all the possibilities, and some possibilities are really remote. Well, that's possible, but very unlikely. And the things that are, this is possible and pretty likely. So you see, that's the probability distribution of all the possibilities. You take a random draw from that. All right, when you random draw, then that's what he sees. We can do the, that same experiment with anything where there's a lot of uncertainty. Do it under the do it under the ocean. Put a put a, a, a uh, one of those contraptions with a camera in it. It goes down. You know, I don't know how deep. You know, five miles or something gets down in some of the deepest, darkest trenches where nobody's looked before, and look around and take some pictures. And it works the same way. You get a random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities. And what is this possibilities? It's possibilities within the rule set, right? A virtual reality has a rule set. And that rule set says there's 100 different ways 
that you could have an answer about what's there at that depth in the ocean that would not conflict with history or with anything that's in our reality. It would be a, an acceptable solution to find something. You, know, you wouldn't want to go down there and find dancing pink elephants, right, at five miles under the ocean. That's not in the probability distribution, you see. But there are a lot of things that might be that you could say, well, here it is. See, that's unusual, but that's, that's what we found, and it fits. It doesn't conflict with anything. So once you have that variability, all that uncertainty of what it might be, that's, that's how you take a random draw from those possibilities, pull one out. Of course, you're more likely to get the things that are likely than the things that are unlikely, but you might get one of those unlikely things. That's the way it works. There's another good example. In physics, we have a thing called uh, tunneling. Tunneling is, a, is an important uh, concept. We have tunneling diodes that are probably part of this electronic equipment here that's a, it's a manufactured part, and it depends on this concept of tunneling. What tunneling is, is that if you put a bunch of particles, any kind of particle, let's call them electrons. Electrons are always a good particle to use. If you have a bunch of particles and you have them in what's called a potential well, and that's a thing that you've got forces arranged, magnetic fields perhaps, that these particles just can't get out. So let's say they're all electrons, they all have a negative charge of one, and you've got a magnetic field around them that if they try to get out, it pushes them back. They just can't get out, they're trapped. Well, there's a probability of one in a million that they could get through there. It's very, very unlikely. Maybe one in 10 million that they could actually somehow work their way through that barrier, very unlikely. But particles are small. So let's say you have 10 billion particles in the box, and only one in 10 million say that it gets out. Well, a whole lot of them are gonna get out, right? Tens of thousands of them are gonna get out because that one in them, 10 million is gonna happen a lot because you've got billions and billions of particles. That's what they see. They see this leakage current, which they call tunneling, where these particles just appear. It's like they disappear from in here and appear out there. They teleport from this to that. And suddenly they just appear and there they are. And there's a little stream of them going by. And uh, it's a leakage current. And again, it's, it's required in some, in some electronics. That little leakage current is useful. So that's called tunneling. And again, it's... It can't happen in an objective reality, but it does happen because it's probability. So what's happening is every time that particle has a new position, you're going up and you're drawing a you know, probability, and most of the time that probability puts it right in the box and keeps it in the box. But every once in a while, you draw something out of the 10 sigma, you know, out of the distribution, and bingo, it appears outside the box. That's been around in physics for probably 70, 80 years. See, again, some things that are old. There's lots of mysteries in physics that just kind of happen and people don't know. Now, quantum mechanics can predict that as long as they start with an assumption that the particles aren't particles, they're probability distributions, and that falls right out. Sure, that happens. So there's lots of these sorts of things. Um, So the result of a particular measurement is randomly sampled from an array of discrete possible states that represent the probable future at that instant. All right, so we've already done that. Um, the result, those, those possibilities in that distribution you know, have to fall within the natural uncertainty of the problem, of what you're dealing with. Okay, no pink elephants under the ocean. So every object, every event contains some uncertainty. All right, let's turn the page. We have made it to lunch.